Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today to talk about Gideon the Ninth. If you don't know why I'm wearing glasses, it's because you haven't read Gideon the Ninth. <laughs> I'm gonna do a non-spoiler section in the beginning, wherein I will wear these glasses, then I will take them off and do spoilers. So you know. You may not know why I'm wearing glasses per se, but you know, in the context of this video, why this is happening. Did I like Gideon the Ninth? Uh... Mm, I find it very difficult to discuss this book, to rate it. I found it difficult to read. I find it very difficult to explain. So this is gonna be a great video. Gideon the Ninth, if you haven't heard of it, I think you missed the hype train. It is, I think, being pitched, being promoted as lesbian necromancers in space, which both under and oversells it. It is technically that. There's a lot you can do with those ingredients. That's really, those are just ingredients. So like if you saw a bunch of ingredients laid out in a kitchen, you could have some guesses what somebody could cook with it, but there's a lot of different ways you could go. So those are just, some ingredients that are in there, for sure. That's accurate. Getting the ninth, plot-wise, it doesn't really have a plot for most of the book, which is why I found it difficult to read and why I find it difficult to talk about. So the, at the outset, Gideon is in the ninth house and is trying to leave the ninth house. You don't really know why, but she is prevented from leaving the ninth house by her arch nemesis, who then says, you're going to come with me to this other place and be my bodyguard. And if you do that, then I'll set you free. And then Gideon goes with her nemesis to that other place where she is her bodyguard, where a whole lot more nothing happens. And then two thirds, three quarters of the way through the book, we get like a rip roaring, totally had my attention, closed circle mystery story that I was super here for. And then the end lost me again. So that's why I find it difficult to rate. For that section that it had my attention and interest, it had my attention and my interest. And I thought to myself when I got there finally after not DNFing it, that if it continues to hold my interest through to the end, I give it a three. It didn't. So I gave it a two. It's been compared to Nevernight and I see why, but the plot has, is nothing like Nevernight. So I think the reason it's compared to Nevernight is because Gideon is irreverent and sarcastic and stabby and queer. And those elements from Nevernight of Mia slash Mr. Kindly, because he's pretty snarky, are present in Gideon the Ninth. So if that's like your jam, is having a stabby, irreverent, queer, sarcastic lead, then this book's got that. <laughs> if that's all you want. It 100% has that in spades. But where J. Kristoff over delivered on the world building, i.e. extensive footnotes, Gideon the Ninth has next to no world building. For most of the book, I kept asking, why are we here? Where is here? Who are these people? Why should I care about any of this? What are their motivations? What are the stakes? What world are we in? None of this is answered, ever. And I get the sense from the book that it wasn't something that anyone felt needed to be answered. It just like wasn't a question in terms of the book. It was a question I had. Those were questions, many questions that I had. The book was like, that nah, sucks. So if you don't give any shits about world building, again, Gideon the Ninth, you'll probably love it because it is like irreverent, queer, stabby necromancers in space. So if you like just want to see people making bad, sometimes good jokes, and lots of stab-stab, skeletons being reanimated, people hating each other, you're not exactly sure why, but they definitely do. And then finally, quite a creepy closed circle mystery that like full on definitely had my attention, and then back to nothing again. Y'all love Gideon the Ninth. It was not for me. That said, I will read the next book, because uh, mainly I want to know if any of my world building questions ever get answered, because I kind of feel like they have to be, because we're just, we have to go to another place in the next book. You have to. So uh, I will be curious, but mm, no. So I think that's all I can say without spoilers. So if you haven't read Gideon the Ninth, bye. So like pretty much what I just said, like I have all these questions about the world building or lack thereof. So in the beginning, when Gideon is trying to leave, we just get that she wants to leave, which fine, that's... That's not really a motivation though. That's just like a, an activity, <laughs> like a goal for the present, but I don't know why. And I don't know why I should root for it. And I don't know why I should be, I should be sad if that's not attained. Just that I get the Gideon really, really wants to leave. <laughs> so there's this like animosity between Gideon and Harrow, which again is not compelling because I don't really know why. I don't really know why Harrow would have reason to hate Gideon 
I don't really know why Gideon hates Harrow other than that Harrow seems to hate Gideon. But they're working together, so that's fine, I guess. And then we get to this other place, um, and all these other houses are there, and they're not really well described or explained, so I don't really know where they come from. Where are these other houses? Are they all other planets? Are they stations that are man-made? Where did they... Like, what... How relevant are they to the larger world? Like, is this just, like, this own little cult that's only relevant to itself? If the Freemasons or the Mormons or whatever had a summit and decided to, like, kill each other, where, like, it's kind of a thing that might be reported on the news, but the outcome doesn't really affect anyone but the people involved? Or are these people that, like, are kind of in charge of the world? Is that the stakes? Because I have no idea. I've read the book and I have no fucking idea. And Gideon herself, you find out way later when we're into the closed circle mystery part that she's apparently been harboring guilt, which feeds into her hatred of Harrow because she blames herself for Harrow's parents' death, which I didn't have to know that it's the parents' death that is bothering Gideon, but I never, ever, ever felt from her that she was feeling guilty about something. She just hated Harrow and was very self-righteous about it. So just having like an inkling that there's something else at play, something for me to ask and wonder and then want to find out. I didn't know there was a thing to find out. And then I found it out and I was like, since when do you feel guilty? That didn't come across in like overtly or in subtext. You've just been pissy and self-righteous. So like the fact that your outward behavior would be pissy and self-righteous, but you'd be harboring guilt, like that would be different. And um, it would make me more interested because I'd be like, why do you feel guilty? There's more to this relationship. It's more complicated. Which when I found that out, I was like, there's more to this relationship. It's more complicated. But it was like two thirds through the book already. So I was like, it's too late. <laughs> That's interesting. But like, I kind of don't care anymore. You waited too long. And again, the close circle mystery. I finally was interested. But even then, I was still like, who are these people? They would constantly have these scenes where everyone's in there and they're all talking and they're all doing stuff. And I'm like, who? What? What do they look like? Who? Where are they from? And they kind of allude to what each of them specializes in, in terms of necromantic abilities. I couldn't keep track of that. And even when they told it to me, I was like, I don't know what the fuck that means. So I hope I don't need to because I don't know what's going on and I don't care about it. Because I don't, again, because of the like the stakes for the world, it seems like because hate Gideon hates Harrow, then I shouldn't really want Harrow to like win. If winning is what we're doing, are we even winning? Is that what's going on here? Like, is it like a Triwizard tournament, but with nine necromancers from different houses and bodyguards? Or what? <laughs> so I shouldn't root for Harrow because I don't think she should be in charge of a world if Gideon hates her and I'm rooting for Gideon, I think. But I don't know why I should root for any other people to run the world if that's what you get at the end of said competition. And again, are you running the world after that? Or are you just kind of the head of your own little cult and no one gives a shit? I have no idea what the stakes are or the context or like, these different philosophies that these other houses purport to espouse, they, again, how do they affect the larger world? Do they affect the larger world? Does anyone care about what they think? Do they care about what they think? Are they just relics of an old time and no one cares? Like, I, no context, no context. So it's very difficult for me to place this, like the stakes. And it doesn't have to be huge stakes. It's fine if it's its own little cult. I just want to know that. I want to know what this is going to affect. Because for Gideon to give a shit about what's going on around Gideon, what she's possibly willing to, well, how far she's willing to go to support Harrow to be free. And at what point she's going to say, maybe the world is more important if the world is the stakes. Uh, is world to the stakes? I don't know. Now, the like reveal about Dulcinea, I didn't know specifically that that would be it. But like pretty much from the moment that she was sickly and helpless, I was like, so she's probably the big bad. Because anytime you have somebody who's so like, obviously, and so purposely physically incapable of doing things in a in a story where everyone else is extremely physically capable and you have a close circle mystery okay it's gonna be it's always the person that's like in the wheelchair couldn't couldn't have done it it's always that person so i was like she's either masterminding this um from the her sick bed or she's not really sick so i was kind of right kind of on both counts so i again didn't know the specifics of it but that could have been less obvious and it would have it's still the whole circle mystery had my attention it creeped me out it could have been less obvious and then the hate to hate love with gideon and harrow also saw that coming don't approve of it and it, it i was talking to my friend about this and i don't know how to feel about it because i can't help but it seems to me that we're meant to like it because it's queer that Gideon and Harrow would be a thing. But Harrow is horrible. 
And the abuse of power over Gideon is reprehensible. So if Gideon was to fall in love with her oppressor, which is what Harrow is, I don't care if it's queer. That's not okay. Ever. That's not okay in a male-female relationship, female-male relationship, male-male, female-female. When you have abusive power mixing in with like romantic and physical attraction, that's yikes. I don't care who's involved. So definitely wasn't shipping it. And I didn't really know Gideon or Harrow enough. If I had a sense for this complexly layered gray relationship that expresses itself largely in hatred and violence, but underpinning it is all of this guilt and baggage, then I would have been invested in finding out what that turns into. Not invested in shipping it, but invested in seeing how that morphs, changes, develops, and affects their ability to work together. But I only found out about the baggage like three quarters of the way through the book. At which point I was like, that, that that's all that's a lot of context for what you guys are doing here and how you talk to each other. But it's way too late. And again, I didn't need to know the baggage. I just needed to know that there was baggage so that I could be like, what's the baggage? What's the baggage? What's the baggage? And then I find it out. I'm like, oh shit, got the great baggage. As opposed to, wait, what? There's baggage? Since when? <laughs> And then, yeah, and then at the end, so the close circle mystery had my full attention and I was genuinely creeped out. And like, I didn't care about any of the characters. So when they were falling and dying, I couldn't tell if I was meant to give a shit because I definitely didn't. I found it interesting. I was curious about which ones were being killed off and why those ones specifically, like who's benefiting from those deaths. It's just a puzzle. I I don't, I hope I wasn't meant to be emotionally invested in any of them dying because I wasn't. I was only marginally invested in Gideon and Harrow surviving. And then when we found out the big reveal about the big bad and it was Dulcinea, and then it turns into this long battle with the like the big boss at the end, basically. And really the only thing left for me to give a shit about is the world building questions that by then I was like, these will not get answered. I'd have to accept this. And then the will they or won't they love and or die for Gideon and Harrow. And I didn't really care if they lived or loved. So the end battle, it went on and on and on. And I was like, can someone please just die? I don't care. Either it's the bad guy or our heroes. Someone needs to die so this can end because I don't care. <laughs> so yeah, Gideon the Ninth was not my cup of tea. And it, there was a lot in there that I can see why it would appeal to people uh, who don't ask those questions automatically. Like, where are we? Why are we here? <laughs> um, if you don't care about where we are and why we're here, you'll probably love Gideon the Ninth. Because the humor, like, was good. I, there was a lot of humor, both from like Gideon talking, uh, like jokes Gideon would make that were funny. And then a lot of things just sort of in the narrator uh, describing things that were kind of quirky and funny. And I found that interesting and unique. And again, all, the book was extremely unique. I don't know anything that I would compare it to other than Nevernight and only Nevernight because of the irreverent stabby queer character. Nothing about the bones of the plot. Forgive the pun. There's a lot of bones. <laughs> There's nothing about the plot that's like Nevernight. So it's uniqueness gets points. <laughs> Originality gets points. And the style of the prose is fairly unique. But please give me some context. Something. Either for internal struggle and motivation or external stakes. At least one of the two. And I got neither. So they couldn't get invested in the characters. And I couldn't understand the stakes and therefore be invested in the outcome of this story because of the world and that will be affected. I was like, why do I give a shit about any of this? The characters don't even seem to give a shit about any of this other than like not wanting to die. And some of them seemed okay with dying. So let me know in the comments down below how you felt about Gideon the Ninth. If, well, I assume you've read it if you made it to this point in the video. Uh, if you watched it because you didn't plan to read Gideon the Ninth, and now are thinking, damn, I wish I had read Gideon in the Ninth instead of spoiling myself. Or even though I've been spoiled, no, I really want to read Gideon in the Ninth. Or man, dodged a bullet there. You know, whatever your reaction is, let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, so like and subscribe. And I'll see you next Saturday.